Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or haven't done so already, please show that subscribe button some love and make sure you set your notification bell to all so you know every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can learn how to become a member or buy me a coffee. All of that information is linked down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True 911 and Dispatcher Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Back in my hometown, I had a friend that worked as an EMT and was one of the first on the scene of a pretty brutal car accident. We had a long two-way road surrounded by chain-link fence on both sides for God knows how many miles. A car full of five teens, two in the front, three in the back, had crashed into it. It was late, and they were all drunk and coming back from a party. Apparently, they had been flying down that road at maybe 80 miles per hour plus when the driver swerved into the fence. The fence was chain-linked and had metal posts, both vertical and horizontal, running along the top. When a car runs into a fence like that and continues to drive through it, knocking the vertical posts one by one, the horizontal ones fall. He said that the car went through maybe 40 feet of chain-link fence. There were more than a dozen metal pipes that went through the windshield and through all of the passengers. The car looked like a pincushion. Whenever we had to cut through the pipes to remove the bodies, they were full of tissue, blood, and brains. Nine one one, what is your emergency? Yeah, um Hi, this is going to sound kind of strange, but there's a man stumbling around in circles in my front yard. Could you repeat that, sir? He looks sick or lost or drunk or something. I just woke up to get a glass of water and heard snow crunching around underneath my front window, so I peeked out. I'm looking at him right now. He's about 10 yards away from my window. Something's not right. What is your address, sir? 1617 Quarry Lane in Pinella Pass. I'm going to send a squad car your way, but that's quite a ways out. Are you alone in your house, sir? Uh, yes, I am alone. Can you confirm that all of your doors and windows are locked? Stay on the phone with me. I know that my front is definitely locked, but I'll go check the back door again really quick. I appreciate your help, by the way. I know this is kind of strange, but I really hope that. Sir? Sir, are you still there? He's, he's in the yard yard, but he's, what the fuck? He's, he's upside down. Sir? Stay on with me. What is happening? He's staring right at me, but he's, he's standing on his hands now. He's perfectly still staring straight at me. He's doing a handstand, and he's smiling at me and not moving. He's... he's doing a handstand, sir? I, I... I don't know how he... how he's facing me and standing on his hands, and he's got... and he's got this huge smile, and he's perfectly still. What the fuck? Please, get someone over here quick. Sir, I need you to remain calm. I put out the call, and an officer is on his way. His teeth are so huge. What the fuck? P please help me. Sir, I want you to try to keep an eye on him. Make sure that your back door is locked again. We need to make sure all possible access points are secured. 
Can you talk me through and confirm that your back door is locked? Um, okay, I I'm walking to the back door now and keeping him in my sight. My hand is on the back door knob now. Um, it's locked. I need to check the deadbolt, so I'm going to take my eyes off of him for a split second. All right, sir. Help is on the way. Just stay on the phone with me. Everything's going to be all right. Sir? Sir, are you there? His... His face. It's up against the glass. Sir? I need you to speak up. What is happening? I looked away for a split second, and now his face, it's pressed up against my front window. His teeth are huge, and he's still smiling. There's no color in his eyes. Jesus, please help me. Why won't it just fucking move? Sir, I need you to go to the nearest room and lock yourself inside of it. Do you have a basement or a bedroom that you can lock yourself in? He won't stop staring. He's going to hurt me. Sir, I need you to listen up. Please go lock yourself somewhere safe until the police officer arrives at your house. Can you hear me? I... Yes. Yes, I, I'm going to lock myself in my room. And you're positive that you're alone in the house, correct? Yes, I'm alone in the house. Wait a moment. He's moving. He's shaking his head. He's telling me no. He can hear us. He's telling me I'm not alone. Sir? Sir, are you there? I heard a loud noise. Is everything all right? Sir? Here is part two to the story I just read. This is very urgent, so I'll get right to the point. I pulled some strings with my colleagues in the department and was able to obtain a copy of the police report that the officer filed in regards to the call two weeks ago. I've got to be extremely careful about covering up the officer's personal information. The investigation is ongoing and there's been some weird stuff happening. You'll see what I mean. The police and news departments are in a frenzy trying to Keep the details quiet for now, and there is a palpable feeling of uneasiness circulating around our town. If my bosses find out that I'm posting this on here, I'll lose my job. So be it. This is the only official statement being released to the public tomorrow morning. Ashland Police Department advises all homes and businesses within five miles of 1617 Quarry Lane Penella Pass to secure all doors and windows by any extra security measure available. Effective immediately, a curfew is in effect for all citizens of the city of Ashland. All persons found on the streets after sundown will be held in question in regards to suspicious cult activity. A police barrier has been placed around the perimeter of the quarry in northwest Ashland. No one is to enter the restricted zone until further notice. Any and all persons found attempting to enter the restricted zone will be subdued on sight. Officers have been ordered to use force at their own discretion. There will be no exceptions. And, um, yeah, here's the transcript from the actual police report filed by the officer that arrived on scene. I don't know how my friend got a copy of this. Actually, I don't want to know. Begin report. Officer, redacted, approached the premises of 1617 Pineapple Pass at 4.37 a.m. on the 9th of February, 2015, in response to a 911 dispatch report of a suspicious person. The officer immediately noticed that there were no lights on in the house and there was no response after the officer repeatedly knocked on the door while identifying himself. Officer, redacted, then noticed a series of erratic footprints and handprints in the snow leading up to the home's bay window. Officer, redacted, noted no evidence of forced entry into the home through the bay window. Upon examining the rear of the house, officer, redacted, noted another set of footprints originating from the edge of the quarry 
approximately 20 yards from the house, and leading directly towards the back of the house. The prints are spaced extraordinarily far apart, indicating that this individual was able to cover an immense amount of ground in relatively few strides. The officer then noted a series of marks, presumed to be hand and footprints, leading directly up to the aluminum siding of the house and ending immediately under an attic window on the third floor. The officer noted that the attic window appeared to have been broken into from the outside. There were no ladders or cables visible, which could have assisted in the invader in reaching the third-story window. Author's note really quick. On the copy of the report that I have, the sergeant of our police department circled this section and wrote in the margin, What the hell? Investigation and verification needed immediately. Upon completion of the officer survey and his inability to enter the house without a lawful warrant, officer, redacted, began driving away in his squad car at approximately 4.43 a.m. As he was calling the station to report his findings, he claims to have witnessed several pale, smiling faces appear in every window of the house, each wearing an expression of what he later described as eager and amused curiosity. End report. As I said, the city issued curfews and information about the restricted zones, and that will be announced tomorrow. But I thought I would alert everyone here first. As far as I know, the exact details of the report are being held in confidentiality because, as you can see, there are some unsettling things surrounding this entire incident. Last author's note. As I was uploading this information, another co-worker friend of mine from the emergency dispatch staff called me to inform me that the officer that was called into the scene has gone missing. You will definitely hear about that tomorrow if you live anywhere near that area. Police units from nearby counties are being brought in to assist in the search. I say this as a dispatcher. Please take these ordinances seriously and report any suspicious findings to the authorities. According to my friend, the officer's wife was the last person to see him. Apparently, as he was leaving their home, he muttered something about wanting to check out that house again. I'm a crime scene killer. To start out, you may need a little backstory to show how I got into the situation. When I got out of high school at around 2003, finding a job was difficult, so I took whatever horrible jobs I could get to get by. When I found a job cleaning fire and water damage full time, I was expected to have steady income and start saying, but this quickly turned into a nightmare that I had to endure for almost two years. The company I worked for put me on the job first, which was a water damage claim where a basement flooded with sewage. So, after a few days of work, we finished, and it was on to the next job. My boss then called me into the office the next morning and told me about a special crew that he was setting up and asked if I would be the crew leader, supervising three guys as they were just hired. I found this strange, as I had only been working there a total of around three days, but I figured my work ethic was already paying off and I could get a raise. I only made $10 an hour to start. Not only did I not get that raise, but I got no training in the position, other than a work van with cleaning materials and the phone numbers for three new guys that also were hired to do fire and water damage cleanup. The boss told me what tools were best to use and what cleaning products to use to sanitize along with where everything was located in the van with hazmat suits and respirators, but he was vague about what kind of things I would be cleaning up. He just said the situations were always different and I would be detailed instructions on each job. He called my position the CSC crew leader. 
The boss told me that I would never have to see the deceased as the coroner would have the remains gone by the time the crew got there. And to use my logic to determine what needed to be removed from the house and what could be cleaned. The first job I had in my new position, which the boss told me about when I got to the office, was cleaning up the remains of an elderly man or woman who died in their house and had been laying in a chair. When we arrived, the coroner had me come outside to show me a few things that were considered hazardous material and needed to be removed due to the risk of disease. I guess my boss knew a few people from the county coroner's office, and much of the work came from their recommendations. Not only was the deceased still in the house, but was fully visible to me and the other guy, and you could smell the rot through the masks as the home had no AC. And this was mid-June. The coroner was backed up and waiting on additional people to show up to load the body as it was falling apart. And I called the body it because I honestly couldn't tell if it was male or female and was trying not to look too long as it was truly disturbing. The other three guys I worked with handled it well, but two got sick from the smell and has to go outside to puke. We all waited outside for the corner to show us the chair, the fluid that leaked into the carpet, in the basement where the fluids went through the subflooring and puddled in some boxes in the basement. The coroner's support arrived and took the deceased out, and me and the crew started working. After about five minutes, weird things started to happen. The first of which was when I began to disassemble the chair. I had removed the back of the chair and was putting it into the special hazmat bags that I was given, and the base started to rock. When I was about 10 feet away, putting the bag with the back of the chair by the front door. Nothing else was in that same room as the other guys were in the basement dealing with moving boxes. I brushed it off and took apart the base of the chair as much as I could, and when I got into the bag, I got a chill straight up my spine and then began feeling sick. I just figured it was the shock of what I was cleaning hitting me and pushed on. Even though the chill was strange, as I was very hot in my full hazmat suit in the middle of June. Next was removing the carpet and assessing the floor to see if it could be cleaned or if I had to remove a section of the floor. So I called the boss to ask him, and he told me just to pour the special cleaner on the area to soak it into the floorboards, and it would be fine. So I got it out of the truck where he said it was and brought it inside. When I got inside, all three of the guys in the basement were scrambling to get out of the basement, tripping over each other, and all three ran outside. When I asked them what was going on, all three said there was someone in the cluttered basement, and they assumed it was a homeless person or maybe a junkie. Detroit has many issues with these kind of things. I listened at one of the open windows to the basement. It's kind of the first thing we did when we started working. Open any windows possible, prop the doors open, so maybe someone got inside then or possibly before we got there and was hiding. After listening for a few minutes and hearing nothing, me and another of the workers went inside, armed with a mag light and a piece of metal fence post, and searched the basement. Nothing was down there but the footprints of the shoe covers we used. But when we started up the stairs, we heard a horrible hacking cough from somewhere in that basement. When we looked for it, there was nothing but the corner of the basement had a bunch of dust stirred up, like someone was moving things very recently that weirded us both out. We called the guys back in, and they got back to the boxes, but all of them kept feeling like they were being touched while throwing away material from the boxes that got fluids on them. I went back to the upstairs job, but found that the cleaner 
I put next to the floorboards was gone. I started getting frustrated as it was the only jug I had of this cleaner, and I clearly remember it being set next to the area and before the guys ran up to the stairs and my attention was redirected. I began to take out our trash, figuring I would find it eventually, or the basement guys took it for the floor and I found it on its side. Behind the bag, they had the back of the chair. This is impossible. There were like six other bags in front of this one near the front door, and this was a gallon bottle of cleaner. Again, I got a chill, but this one was brought on by what sounded like a whisper that I could not make out the words to. I cleaned the floorboards and moved out trash, job complete. That night, each member of my crew had a dream about an older man telling us that we are not welcome in his home, touching his belongings, and we need to leave. In my dream, I was alone in his house. The old man cried and told me I was destroying his things, and he couldn't replace anything. He was trying to push me out of his house, but it was like I was ignoring him, even when he would push me and scream at me. No reaction from me. He then threw my cleaner into the garbage pile I had made by the front door, exactly where I found it. Two of the three guys in the crew told me their dreams about the old man pushing them as they went through boxes of ruined pictures and other old stuff that needed to be thrown out due to the risk of disease from its fluids. They also said that it was like they had no control and were on autopilot. They said that they were so sad but couldn't do anything. The thing that got me about this dreams ordeal of the other two guys was they both said the man was getting so upset that he began violently coughing, and that the man kept grabbing their arms when they would touch boxes or throw things into the trash. Neither of the guys were in the house when they told me, and the other guy heard the coughing from the basement. The guy that went into the basement with me said he had heard, but all he remembered was waking up, sad like he did something wrong, and a horrible coughing fit which might just be a coincidence, but I connected it in my mind as relating to the other dreams. As we talked about it and came to the conclusion that we were all just having a reaction to the situation, and it was nothing more than our brains coping with what we had to do. I'm very into psychology, so I rationalized the best I could, and we hoped for better assignments the next day. Next few jobs weren't so bad, cleaning up blood at a home invasion. No casualty, but huge mess. Then there was a few other bodily crime scenes with casualties, but nothing notable happened. About a two weeks into the job, we began to learn the tricks of the trade and were split into two different groups that I was responsible to manage as crew leader so I would have to go to different sites if the other two guys had an issue or didn't know what to do. I thought I was getting used to the job as well as the other guys, as we had no experiences like the first job, but I was wrong. The next job, there was activity. It was a suicide of a man. He was probably middle-aged. The coroner had already removed the body. But it was a mess. The guy had shot himself with what I think was a large caliber handgun or shotgun. As the spray was everywhere in the basement, like a second living room, there were skull fragments lodged into the drywall, brain matter all over. And again, he was not found for a bit, so the smell was even horrible. The first step in cleaning this was using our backpack vacuum cleaner to suck up all the bio material. The coroner told us when we went in that he and his partner were extremely uneasy in the house and it felt strange and we immediately started getting a claustrophobic suffocating feeling when we entered into the basement as well. To make matters worse, 
The family of the man had come over and were crying upstairs, but the vacuum noise helped to cancel that out. While I was cleaning, the power to the lights went out, and it was completely pitch dark. This was strange because my vacuum was still powered. My crewmate started screaming at this point, so I turned off the vacuum and climbed off my ladder. I thought maybe he touched a wire to the lights, but when my vacuum unit was turned off, he was still screaming and I could hear things being knocked over behind him. I started fumbling around for my flashlight on my tool belt and yelled for my friend, asking what was going on, but all I got back was panicked screams. When I saw in the pitch black something darker that was moving in my direction, and I will admit, I freaked out. I slipped trying to back up, still looking in my belt for the flashlight, and found it when my back hit the basement wall. I turned on the light, aimed it at the blackest shape I have never seen, and when the light turned on, I saw the shape of a man wearing a flannel shirt, beard, and an expression like he was about to attack me. Then, it was gone. My crewmate was behind where the entity was, sitting on the floor rocking with his hands on his head. When I approached, he picked up his flashlight off the ground and turned it on then ran up the stairs and outside and threw up. I followed behind him, asking if he was okay and why he was screaming. I thought I'd just imagine the entity and the man because his screaming scared me, but he told me that he was scrubbing the wall and felt something pulling on something in his tool belt, and he thought it was me, but when he turned around, the lights went out, and he was engulfed by what he said was like a dark smoke, and he immediately could not breathe and was struggling to move. He managed to pull out his flashlight, but it was knocked out of his hand, like his wrist was grabbed with force, and he managed to scream. When he did scream, trinkets started falling off the entertainment center that was about three feet to his side, and the black smoke moved back, but he was close to passing out from exertion. He also said he lost hearing and didn't know that any noise came out when he started screaming and that the stuff falling off the shelves was landing on him and that's why he was covering his head. He said it felt like a weight was lifted off of him when the dark smoke backed up but he felt sick right away and the light from the flashlight made the sick feeling increase. We took an early lunch where he just sat there, pale as ever, and didn't say much, other than he said he breathed in that smoke and he didn't feel right. I got him some Gatorade and his colors started to come back. I never told him I saw a man when I turned on the light because we still needed to finish and I didn't want to put that in his head, you know, since he never mentioned seeing it. When we went back, the lights in the basement were on again. Half the things that fell from the shelves were back on the entertainment center, and the TV was on baseball. There was also a different smell in the room, similar to burnt hair. My worker stayed a half hour, got sick, and went home for the day, leaving me alone to finish, which I didn't want to do, but had to, as the other guys had their own jobs. After cleaning up everything with my vacuum, I began scrubbing the old blood, which is hard after it congeals, mixing with brain matter and it's like glue, even with cleaner. When I was finishing up, I kept seeing the shape of a person always in the side of my vision. Every time I would smell that strange burnt hair scent, and a few times, I also felt like a force was pulling at items on my belt. Not sure what items, as there was several things in my belt. When I finished the job, I went to use the bathroom upstairs. And in the hallway along the way, I heard like muffled crying or moaning. I froze up and stayed still, thinking maybe a family member had come back. And when I panned around, 
There was nothing, but I saw a picture on the wall of a man with a beard wearing a flannel, several other pictures in the hallway of other scenarios of the same man, different flannels with deer or fish or family. I had not seen a picture of that man, as I had not been anywhere else in the house with a bathroom. Nor did I use the bathroom downstairs, because pulling off the hazmat suit is a pain in the ass. As I was securing the house, closing all windows, locking doors, and shutting down every light but the front porch light, I saw the front curtain move, and again, I saw the darker than black form in the front window. The last experience that I will share in this story happened mid-July in a very bad area in Detroit. There had been an incident where a guy supposedly tried to abduct a child, was stopped by people in the neighborhood who beat the man very bad and he escaped to his house, where the neighborhood people quickly called the police and civilians surrounded the man's house to prevent escape. The police response time in this area is horrible, and the people were throwing rocks through the man's window and damaging his car. The man was hurt pretty bad by the mob and was hurt by a rock or glass and died in the home. This is Assumption by DPD. From what the police officer told me, it was a misunderstanding, and the man picked up a girl that was injured riding her bike. And some kids that knew her told their parents about the man who was kidnapping her. And people overreacted and the man was brutally beaten. The cleanup was pretty simple to do. We secured windows, cleaned up blood and bodily fluid. But as soon as I entered the house, I just felt wave after wave of fear and sadness. Like I have never felt this before. And it hit in waves that made my legs weak. My working buddy who was there showed up late and didn't get the story from the cop like I did, but experienced the same feelings I had. The whole time we were there, we saw a form darting around corners like it was watching us, then hiding. It was similar to like a small bit of fog or mist. We also heard very slight cries for help coming from several areas in the house and also what sounded like, please stop, and a long, no. A few times the crowd came back and yelled at the house also. And when this was going on, the activity in the house increased and we could hear running footsteps go up the stairs, a door slam, and it sounded like the front door would open and close, but we never saw any of the doors move. The path of the footsteps sounded like it was from the front door, through the living room, to the bathroom, to the stairs, to the upstairs bungalow room. The part that really got me was I could feel the floor impacts. That felt like the vibrations of someone running past me when I was cleaning the areas. And each time, I would be hit by one of those waves of fear and sadness. When we left the house, there were a few people on porches hanging out, like as usual during the summer. And the people were still hostile and yelling random things, but directed at us, loaded the van, and took off our hazmat suits. We ignored this, but before we had loaded all the material from the house into the van and locked the house, the front door slammed hard enough to sound like a gunshot, which scared me and my crew shitless. Along with the people on the front porch to the point where they went inside, the front door deadbolt was somehow locked and we could not get it open. I think it was a different key than the knob. So we ended up leaving several boards in the house that were left over from the boarding of a few of the windows. The feeling of relief when I left that house was like night and day. Inside I was anxious and scared, paranoid, and just feeling really down. Which could be due to knowing the story, but when I got outside, it was like flipping on a light switch. 
I immediately felt better, and me and the other guys in my crew were joking and laughing about dumb stuff and normal 19 and 20 year old shenanigans. I have many of these stories written down in detail in a journal. I started after the first three months of working at this job. I talked to the guys on the cruise and got other strange stories from them too. I know that some of this could very well be formed by my subconscious mind to cope with the traumatic situations, but some of it has no explanation, and when I hear other members of the crew tell me their stories when they haven't been influenced by mine, this is a horse of a different color. When I have time, I will put out the journal and give more of my experiences. The job got way worse when I started the journal after three months in. Several explanations with that I think was paranormal. Many situations that stressed my mental state to the point where my mask of sanity started to slip. In the end, I worked at this place for almost two years and my crew have passed on. Two from suicides, one from drug overdose. That could have been intentional or we will never know. I just know that when those three guys my age, around 19 and 20, started this job, all were normal, well-adjusted guys with no cares in the world other than girls partying and working. I watched each one of them slowly drain their joys and passion for life. And I know this sounds sad, but each one that died was considered enough to die in a clean way. Most likely so another person wouldn't have to see the horrible thing that we all saw too often. I worked on a mine in Australia on the West Coast. Back in 2009, the MIME emergency response team was called to an incident being some fishermen washed off a popular fishing rock nearby called Gartha Rocks. Luckily, we had a ship in port and as such had three tugboats in the vicinity and they were able to respond to the people in the water before our arrival at the port, which is about a 20 minute drive from the main site. We also needed to reverse the ambulance about 150 meters down the jetty as it was only one lane and to leave without it having to pick up was a bit of a priority. We arrived and needed to reverse the ambulance about 150 meters down the jetty as it was only one lane and to leave without having to pick it back up was a bit of a priority. Myself as the officer in charge and three other medics grabbed our first response gear and some extra thermal blankets and made our way down to the lower boat landing and were given flotation devices before we were allowed to board the tug and after doing so, we were ushered to the port side gallery door, which inside three casualties were resting after being pulled from the ocean after about two hours floating around. Due to the tight confines of the galley, the two tug workers that were inside doing their job to look after them had to leave to accommodate my team, and they both left out of the uh, starboard gallery door and remained outside as did three or four other tug workers on the port side door with a few others on other parts of the boat. When we entered, it took a while to adjust to the light, and the layout was a port door behind me, and the starboard door was on the far right opposite wall of the room. There were two tables to my right up against the wall that had a bench seat on either side that you have to slide into the table in the middle, which is all bolted down in place. In front of the two booths was a small gap that you could use to walk through the length of the room and either enter one of these seats or leave by the port or starboard doors. I assessed that there were three people in the room. Two of them were on the guard, one immediately in front of me, 
laying on his side, and the other on his back halfway down the gap, where he walked, and both were middle-aged men with many obvious cuts and scrapes from attempts to climb back up the reef to get to land, but were unsuccessful. The third casualty, however, was an older man who was sitting at the far gallery table, with his hands clasped in front of him, with elbows on the table, and a thousand-yard stare, even though, looking at him, he had as many clear injuries, such as cuts and so forth, with most obviously needing further care, such as stitches and so forth. And there was a lot of blood that oozed out and congealed on that table with his hands, just clasped together from his elbows to the table. I directed the other medics as appropriate during my triage, being one to each of the prone casualties, and myself and another medic attending to old mate just sitting there. We were made aware by one of the other medics dealing with one of the other guys on the floor that this was his dad, and he was earlier very, very upset that he had entered the water after his mate was washed in, and apparently... He kept going on and on about it repeating the same thing over and over, about having a bloody save his son, and only went quiet a few minutes before our arrival. After several attempts, old mate showed no understanding or interest in communication with myself or my partner. So, between us, we decided that shock and or hypothermia was probably a factor and attempted to at first just put a thermal blanket around him while at the same time I would try to take some primary vitals and see if there was any obvious life-threatening bleeding above or under the table. Holy shit, did it go pear-shaped from there? Old mate looked at my other medic dead in the eye and said, you can't adjust this. You were just occupying my presence. You need to let me keep going. I looked at my partner the same way. We have many times before. When we had come across a hysterical or incoherent casualty, but this bloke was so calm and unwavering with interfaced fingers and deadpan voice that we just stared at each other, waiting for the other to take charge or initiative, which is quite common in these circumstances. After a few seconds, I found composure and informed him that he had encountered a spot of mischief, and we needed to assess and fix his wounds, and that soon we would be in the hospital, and all would be progressing from there, and he has to relax, etc., etc. Well, old mate quick as fuck, just stood upright, and the tabletop broke free of its base and hit me pretty hard in the right leg. Now, I don't mean that the tabletop was rotted or shitty, or it was poorly fastened to the floor. I mean the fucking tabletop made an audible splinter from where I saw him standing up with the force concentrated on him and his two little front thighs, and actually broke it loose, pushing it onto me, and me against the back of the seat. My mate, Medic, being so cramped in a tight area of the gallery, he told me this later, that he put out his left hand to the casualty and his right hand to the tabletop to grab it slash stabilize it. Old mate was very quick and pushed past my mate, Medic, and went out to the starboard gallery door like the fucking wind. I pushed the table forward on the bench top, and both myself and mate medic followed probably only one or two seconds behind old mate, but a search of the deck and a run up the stairs proved nothing in finding him, and no one outside the gallery saw anything except myself and my partner. There are stairs that lead up to the wheelhouse, and up there were six or seven higher ups from the mining company, and none of them saw anyone but us climb the stairs in a frantic fit looking for our old mate. 
But the search of the deck and a run up the stairs proved nothing in finding him, and no one outside the gallery saw anything except myself and my partner. Upon return to the gallery, the guy who handed our inflation devices before boarding was still manning the deck, and he said no one passed him. The captain of the tug was behind the controls the whole time because he was required to keep the nose of the tug against the dock, and three other dock hands were all outside the doors, port and starboard, all of which provided a 360 view of the lower deck, and all said they did not see anyone leave after we medics entered the gallery. We returned to the gallery, and despite being weirded out by the other two casualties, were treated and transferred off-site to the hospital. In the debrief, it was only myself, my partner, and one of the other two medics that verified that the older guy was in the room as the other medic. Involved has no recollection, but thinks she was just too involved in their own case, and the tugboat crew reported stated, Two people pulled from the water, and there was never a third casualty. I tried to talk to the casualties in the hospital. Afterward, to try and get some answers and find out if they saw him, or if indeed old mate was one of their fathers. But after my two consecutive day shifts ended, and I had the day before beginning night shift to go to the hospital, they had both been discharged. My brother-in-law works at the same hospital, and he said that nothing was untoward about them except one guy was all, I'm so happy to be alive, while the other guy did not do much else than sit silently, looking out the window and not eating a thing. To this day, I still have no idea what the fuck happened, but, as is usual, only myself and mate, medic speak about it occasionally, when we are drunk and that's all we can do. Thank you for listening to my story. All right, dear listeners, I am so sorry to cut this short, but this does bring a close to our true 911 dispatcher stories. I will be re-releasing another part to this video, but this one needed to be cut short because the other uh, stories are way too long to read on this one. So, before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge and give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Samantha McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support, because without you, there is no me, and there is no back to ashes. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.